Hey, North Metro. I'm in Greece right now, but I'm joining you via video, so excited to be with you. We are in part three of a five-part series called Better Together. And we all believe that we are better together, right? But we just don't always practice that, if we're real honest. Because so many things in our world can divide us, and, it, and it's really easy to become pretty isolated. To top it all off, right, life is crazy, and people can actually sometimes be dramatic, right? So sometimes it's just easier to simply avoid community and live in our own controlled kind of bubbles. But what if the way to a better me is actually through we? What if we truly get better together? What if, what if life could actually be better together? And so today, I will once again submit to you that we believe as a church that when it comes to growing your relationship with God, we are always better together. I know there's things like that are always better together, like fitness is always better together and you need accountability, right? Or, or I know diets are better together because you need support. And I have friends, I know sobriety is better together because they need a sponsor. But when it comes to God, you might be thinking, really, Rob, really? I mean, because it's a personal thing, right? Actually, yes, it's a very personal relationship, uh, a very per personal thing. But many people take that to mean private. I mean, a relationship with Jesus was always meant to be personal, but never private. And one of the areas in life where we have a tendency to think most individually is when it comes to me and God. And so here's a few things that people might be thinking. Like, you might be thinking, wait, well, hey, spirituality is just a personal thing, like I said, or it's a private thing. You've got your way, I've got my way, right? Different strokes for different folks, right? You like to pray out loud. I, I just I just rather pray quietly, by, be by myself. You read your Bible every day. I choose to listen to a podcast. You go to church and sing. I, well, I go to golf. I play golf and I pray, or I cuss and then I pray. And in some ways, right, this, these things can be true, uh, except for that, maybe that last one. But the reason we have different denominations, on if you think about it, is due to different styles and preferences and convictions. But what if we're missing out on something? right? What if we're actually missing something there? Within organizations and companies, it has become very trendy, albeit incredibly helpful, to discuss personality profiles. And two of the main identifiers when it comes to personality profiles, uh, personality profiles is the extrovert and the introvert. Now, if, if you're an extrovert, it doesn't mean, oh, you're the life of the party. No, it just means that you mainly gain energy or recharge from being around people. If you're an introvert, it means that you mainly gain energy or recharge from being by yourself. Now, I'm an extrovert, but I'm finding that the older I get, I think I'm actually starting to move towards the introvert, introvert side of the scale. I love being around people, but I definitely need you know time for myself. Now, my friend Rusty, the guy who wrote the book that the series is based upon, uh, he is a poster child for the introvert. Maybe some of you can actually resonate. So he, he, here's what I know about Rusty. He gains energy from being alone, and he feels drained after being with people for a long period of time. And don't get me wrong, he, he likes people, he loves people, but he also likes being alone too. He loves his family, but sitting alone watching Sports Center after they've gone to bed is energizing for him. He said this recently. He said, you know, Rob, there are times I schedule a lunch with someone and I go to a restaurant only to find they forgot, right? That's happened to me, maybe that's happened to you. He says, there I am, I'm sitting at the table by myself and I get a text like, sorry, I, can we reschedule or traffic or I've got another meeting, a double book, I forgot, whatever, it doesn't matter. And the server is usually very sympathetic, like, oh, I'm so sorry you got stood up. And Rusty says, I'm just like, oh, that's okay, that's okay. But politely, I'm, think, I'm saying that, but in my mind I'm thinking, this is awesome. He says, I'm even the weird type that can actually go to the movies by myself. Not only do I, I, not, I, don't, have to sh I don't have to share the popcorn, but there's no pressure to answer any questions. We don't have to talk about it. No one's interrupting me. There are no distractions. It's just me and the movie. I don't feel sad. I don't have a pity party. I don't feel like I'm a loser. I'm a proud introvert. But here's something that I've observed. I meet a lot of introverts who have come to believe that life is actually not better together. It's better alone. And if that's you, I just have something I would love for you to consider. I believe that Jesus, our Savior, was an introvert. So just consider these facts. Jesus once spent 40 days in prayer, alone, in the desert. While you might be a proud introvert, that is taking it to another level. In Mark's Gospel, he tells us that Jesus once, he got up while it was still dark to go be alone with his Father, his Heavenly Father. When the disciples find him and tell him that the crowds are looking for him, he says, oh, they're looking for me? That's great. Let's go somewhere else. 
classic introversion, right? Another time we read about him, he's on his boat trip with his disciples. And while, while they're tending the sails and they're telling stories, maybe they're laughing at Peter's antics, I don't really know, Jesus quietly descends down into the belly of a ship to take a nap. Only introverts can nap when there's a party going on upstairs. Me being an extrovert, if there's a party going on, I'm going to be there, not an introvert. Jesus, he goes down. He takes a nap, introvert. There are many practices of connecting with God that really suit introverts. And there are things like silence and solitude, right? This, this is the taking time away just for you to be alone. A good thing for anyone, but it suits introverts. The purpose there is just to shut out the distractions and the noise that can drown out God's voice. Maybe for you, if you're an introvert, you just love like driving for hours and just listening to God or, or walking or hiking or riding your bike alone. All great things, but again, suited for introverts. There is this discipline of, of reading and prayer, right? Just being alone and through reading books from current authors to the classics to your Bible, you can sharpen your thinking and soothe your soul. And you, that's a time when you can quietly talk to God and your mind rather, rather easily just due to your introversion. Even worship services, think about this. It's not hard for an introvert to go to church, uh, go to a church of thousands of people and still be alone, right? You can go by yourself, you can sit by yourself, and you can talk to no one except when we ask you to meet and talk with someone you don't know during the greeting time. But singing alone, your eyes are closed, no distractions, then listening to the message, just focused on nothing but how this might apply to you. Introverts, man, they think this is awesome. But even if you're not an introvert, I bet you can probably sympathize with some of these things, right? Or maybe you can sympathize with this. You may feel like you're the only one in your home who's a Christian, so your faith actually has to be a private thing. You, you may be the only one at the office who knows the Lord, who, who is a, a follower of Jesus, so your faith is either in secret or you may feel like a martyr, right? You stand out, but you still stand alone. Or maybe, Maybe Christians surround you, but you're the only one interested in actually growing in your faith. Maybe there's a lot of churchgoers around you, but you're the only one who's like, man, I, wanna, I want to refine and grow in my relationship with Jesus. People are, are put off by maybe your commitment to prayer and your devotional time, so you begin to think, man, I guess it is just me and Jesus. And after some time, there's a part of us that thinks that maybe being a lone ranger may, not, you know, may, may be the only way to deepen your faith, or maybe it's not only the way to deepen your faith, but it just may be the only way just because of your situations. But here's something to think about. Even though Jesus retreated to be by himself, he always returned to people. He always did. After 40 days in the desert, you know what he does? He goes to a wedding. That's an introvert's nightmare. As, as for his early morning quiet time, well, he then moves to another town to preach to the masses. In fact, even at Jesus' darkest moment in life, hanging on the cross, he actually engaged with others. There's a thief next to him. And then he's asking his friend John to take care of his mother, right? The scriptures expand on this concept with, with all of the instructions about our need for community. We were designed to be together. There's this letter in the back of the Bible that was uh, written in the first century. Uh, and it's in the New Testament, actually. It's called the letter to the Hebrews. Uh, this, in this book, the author keeps using this phrase, let us, emphasizing that this is not a solo sport. As they were, those who would hear this or read this, they would know it's not about a private thing. So for all of us who might think that we can have a relationship with Jesus and it be a private thing, or it's just Jesus and me, or you know, you've got your way, I've got mine, the author of this letter seems to say, hey, if you do faith alone, you are missing out. There are some levels of faith that are best reached together rather than simply being alone. And so let me just show you some perks and then just kind of tell you how we can actually do this together. And so the first thing I want to say is there's benefits with this. And so benefit number one is this, my faith works better together. The letter to the Hebrews begins with a reminder of the community's original confession of faith. As the writer lists out these qualities of Christ and tenets of their faith, he's declaring, hey, this is what we signed up for. This is who we believe and this is how he rolled. So it makes sense throughout the rest of the letter that he continues to exhort the believers to join together in their faith. Faith, when you think about this, a lot of people might think of faith kind of like playing golf, right? Sure, you can ride in a cart with someone, uh, but, you know, when it comes down to you, it's just you, your club, and the ball. It's just you. It's a solo man sport. But I would say this. I would say, actually, we get this from Hebrews and all over the place. 
but it's probably more like basketball. It's more like football. It's more like baseball. There's a team involved. It's not just about me. It's not about, hey, I'm the hot dog and I'm going to win the whole thing. No, you've got to use one another. You've got to uh, leverage one another. They've got to be able to use your gifts and your, it's, it's a together thing going on. So the reality is this, we need each other and rely on each other and we get there quicker together. So let's read in Hebrews chapter four, verse 16. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. So granted, the emphasis of where we receive grace is found at the throne of God, right? That's the emphasis here. But there's something to us being together in order for us to fully receive it when we need it most. I can't help but just think about the men who brought their friend to Jesus on the mat. It's a great story in the Gospels. He had been paralyzed for years. Now, no doctor could help him. He couldn't find a job. All he could do was sit on his mat on the city streets and ask for money. I can only imagine what his cardboard sign may have said, right? Like if he had one today, it was like, unable to work, or been like this for life, or please have mercy, just give money. I don't know. But the one bright spot for him was that he had some friends. They were probably the ones who took him to the corner every single morning, right? They were the ones who, who brought him home at night. And when, when they heard of this miracle worker named Jesus, he was coming to town, they were the ones who decided to bring him to Jesus. So he's at Peter's house and the room was packed and he's teaching. It's packed with people and there was no way in. But these guys were persistent. I can almost hear them saying things like, hey, we just got to get him in there. Even if we have to tear the roof off. Hey, not a bad idea, right? Let's maybe we do that. So, they, so here's what they did. They climbed up the roof. They hoisted up their friend, his, uh, their friend and they began to disassemble, dis disassemble the shingles, right? And I've always wondered how, 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 how willing was this paralytic guy, right? I mean, he had to have felt rather foolish being pulled up the side of a building, right? But after years of begging, and I'm sure pride was probably not something he struggled with. So eventually they get the roof open and they lowered their friend down into the presence of Jesus. And here's what happens. He forgives the beggar of his sins and then he heals him of his paralysis. Now, could he have found forgiveness of sins through prayer alone in his closet, right? Being by himself? Sure, you bet. Anyone can, you bet. But he would have missed out on the healing. This small community of friends said, hey, let us go to Jesus. Let us go together. And they found mercy and grace at a level they would never have found on their own. So let's go back into Hebrews. So in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verse 28, it says, Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping, worshiping Him with holy fear and awe. Man, there is something when we receive in corporate worship that, that we just simply can't get on our own. We see other people worship, we hear other people's stories, and we see other people connect with God, even when we might feel like we're not, right? This word worship can also be translated as service. When we are thankful together and when we please God together, we're not only, we not only just worship Him, we are in a sense serving Him. Think about that. As we serve each other, we serve our Lord. It is an act of worship. Jesus goes on to tell in the Sermon on the Mount that our service actually directs people to God. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Here's what I've seen. Over the past 13 years of being at North Metro, I've watched thousands of people serve and be served around here. And whether it be in our Next Generation ministry or our Stephen ministry, a Bible study leader or in a Fresh Start class or wherever, I'm continually amazed at what I see God doing within and through those who serve. And when I see and hear of the power and grace of God moving through one person to bless someone else, amazing things happen. Here's what happens. People grow in their trust and love of God. And personally, I mean, when I force myself, when I make myself just get out of my comfort zone, sometimes it's, 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 you've got to force yourself, right, to serve others. I find that I not only strengthen their faith, I actually, actually deepen my own. I'm more like Jesus when I am with others. Jesus, listen, he was the lead servant. He washed his disciples' feet. Feet. He, came, he healed the sick, he encouraged the broken, and he even challenged the comfortable. All his actions were to serve. I mean, he said that I came to serve, not be served. And serving only happens with other people. 
The only person I serve when I'm alone, it's me. When I'm alone, the world revolves around me. I get my way 100% of the time. I'm in complete control, or so I think, right? And sometimes in that setting, sometimes I can even assume that God is there to serve my bidding. But when I'm around others, I'm forced to yield to what others need. I don't always get my way, because in those moments, it's not about me. I have opportunities to meet their needs. I'm able to serve. I get to serve is what we say about here. We get to do this. And with this being such a valued character trait, it should not surprise us that the writer of Hebrews instructs his readers to not give up connecting with God together. Look here, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Look, North Metro, we live in a culture where the average church attendance in our country has dropped from, uh, dropped to one out of every three Sundays. Now, it doesn't sound so bad to say, I go to church about every three weeks, but it sounds a little bit different, different when we say, hey, last year I went to church 14 times. And if the weekend attendance is that low, right, is, is, is that low, the extra gatherings of small groups and mission trips and service projects and Bible studies, I'm here to tell you they're even less. And that means in a given year, we only engage with the community of believers 14, 15, 16, 17, maybe 20 times. And the author of Hebrews, he he saw this coming and he warned us, don't give up meeting together. It's It's necessary for your soul. We need to recognize that our faith grows better together. So here's benefit number two. My faith finds fulfillment better together. The call for us to work as a team is not just because our faith simply works better together, but also because we are designed to find our deepest fulfillment this way. We were created in the image of God, our triune God, a God who exists in community, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They live in perfect union of service to one another and deep relationship. For those of us who think that the apex of our faith experience comes by being maybe awake in the middle of the night by a dream or a personal retreat or even silent epiphany while listening to a podcast or a message, the author of Hebrews encourages us to find even greater fulfillment by journeying with each other. And in doing so, God creates in us and through us our richest fulfillment. Look here in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. So then, since we have a a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. Another theme in Hebrews is Jesus as high priest. The author uses this language to describe the whole community, which performs priestly tasks. Yeah, and we'll see that in chapter 13 and verses 15 and 16. Again, this notion is of a community in action and following God in action. And while the emphasis is on the great high priest, Jesus, don't overlook the how, that how we should actually do this together. There are, there are just some things that we, North Metro, we just, we wouldn't learn if left to our own devices. We need other people. I love what author and speaker Bob Golf says. He says, you know why God doesn't speak to me audibly? Because then I wouldn't listen to you. And we need one another. God speaks through other people in our lives. So maybe what we need to do is maybe move from consumer to community. And uh, here's a few things. First, just recognize that my individuality is still important, right? You, you need your daily time with God. You need your prayer days, right? Your prayer retreats. You need your solitude and silence. Just recognize this is not the end. Second thing is this. Make efforts to turn worship services actually into conversations. Instead of showing up late, ooh, maybe I'm striking a nerve there, or leaving early or evaluating how good the message was or whether or not you thought the music was too loud, Maybe make a decision that you'll engage in conversation with other people. Maybe before you even get here, that's what you're going to do. When you get there, maybe you talk to the people around you, right? Hey, how are you? How was your week? Then on the way out, make an effort to talk to other people. Get to know people. Make connections. And make a point to talk to people who are actually not like you. We're trying to grow in this as a church. You know, and maybe say things like, hey, how can I pray for you this week? Right? You meet someone. It's okay to ask them that. And when you pick up your kids from the children's ministry, maybe just take time to thank the volunteers who serve, right? Get to know them. Thank the greeters on the way out. Thank the people who served you coffee and, muff- and, and a muffin that day, right? Maybe you'll be, be surprised at what new relationships God creates through those comments. So the third thing is this, is judge your experience at the churches, at the church through someone else's eyes. And this is huge. The best way to do this is by bringing a guest with you. 
You never see your church the way you should until you bring a friend, right? That's when you start going, oh, are they going to play that song? What, what are they going to think? I've noticed that my non-Christian friends never say things like, oh, it was too loud, or I wish they played more hymns. When we did a series recently called At the Movies, I had a few people, friends, who, uh, who have been Christians for a long time, and they mentioned things like, hey, y'all showed too many clips from these movies, right? Well, we don't need all these movie clips, just teach the Bible. But some of my friends who are far from God finally showed up to church when I invited them. And they said things like, that was awesome. But they also shared things like, you know what? Man, this reminds me, I, I really need to get my family to church. And when I was a kid, we did that. Or, man, I, I want to know more about this because it seems like this is some really cool stuff, stuff I need. See, they judge base, things based on how will this save my marriage? How, how will this help my drug-addicted teen? Right? If you're serving on the weekend... Ask what kind of experience the people you served actually had. Do they have any questions? Would they come back? How, how could I pray for them during the week? That's how we engage one another, to do life together. The next thing I would recommend is simply this. During the week, find ways to share the Bible with other people. Rather than just read it on your own, read it with your family, right? Read it out loud at the dinner table. Get into a small group. We talk about this all the time. I'll talk more about it in a second. Right? Email and text verses to each other, encouraging words. Now, here's a caution. This shouldn't be used to condemn. It's not like you, hey, I sent you a text. I read this verse about greed and thought about your new car. Have a nice day. No, come on. No, rather, we want to encourage one another like, hey, I read this verse and I thought it might brighten your day. Finally, one of the best ways to deepen your faith is to pray for someone else's faith. And this is huge. One of the most overused phrases in the Christian community is, hey, I'll be praying for you. But you know what? Often we don't do it. Or you know what's seldom heard? Following up on that request like, hey, how's your job situation? I've been praying about it. Or calling or texting or grabbing coffee saying, hey, I've been praying about your daughter moving to college. I know it's been a stressor. How's she doing? I want to know how I can keep praying. This is a fantastic way for us to live in community because so much of this can be done on email or text. But listen, there's nothing like grabbing coffee with someone and having face-to-face -face conversation and developing those relationships. Here's another thing. Keep a prayer journal of other people's needs and then follow up, right? I know many families who keep Christmas cards from friends throughout the year and then they pray for each family. Maybe a different night they'll pick up a card and over dinner they pray for them. And it allows them to say, hey, what's, how are you doing? It keeps us out of the rub of just like, help me, God, bless me, protect me. And it forces us to actually think about other people. Here's a couple things I want you to consider. One of the things is a, a cool new app that I've seen called Ceaseless Prayer App. What's cool is it actually grabs your contacts and every single day give you a verse, but it also brings up three people from your contact list. And so like I've been doing this, and so randomly people from my contacts who I may not normally pray for, it gives me an opportunity to pray for them and even write a note like, hey, I prayed for this person. And actually I had United Airlines in my uh, phone and for some reason it popped up, but I prayed for United Airlines, it's fine. Uh, another thing coming up, it's coming up here at the end of the month uh, in October, it is something called Group Connect. And this is a way, we talk about it all the time, this is a way for you to actually connect with other people in a normal, regular routine. If you've never gotten into a group, into one of our life groups, or even if you've never gotten into our Bible studies, man, listen, jump in. Jump in and try it out. And I say it all the time. Listen, if you get into a group and you're like, after you know, a couple of months, you're like, I just don't connect with anyone. Well, then let us know. We'll put you in another group. It's okay. It's all right. I have friends that go, we were in this group. Really wasn't a fit. But then we found this one. And oh my goodness, we do everything together. We grow together. We read, we're texting you know, prayers to one another. Everything has changed. And if you ask them to say, what was the pivotal change in that growth spurt for you with your relationship with Jesus? They'll say, it was being with other people, not doing it by myself. And so jump into a group. And another thing I would say is this, join a team. We have so many places to serve around here. And I have seen over the years the camaraderie that actually happens when people jump onto a team, like the parking team, a children's ministry team, a next gen team, right? Any of these, Stephen ministry, whatever, being a part, serving together. When I say a team, I don't mean like baseball, but you could do that and that'd be fine. But I mean like joining a team to serve because, man, you are forced to be around other people, to get to know one another. You get to pray for one another, talk with one another, engage conversation. It's a great way to build community. North Metro, I have, uh, I've seen it in my own life, and I'm convinced of it in so many ways. But especially when it comes to growing in your relationship with Jesus, we will always be better together 
It is how we were designed to live and to grow. So let's jump into community. Let's keep going. If you were out for a while, you're like, hey, I need to get back in. Jump back in. Jump back in. Let's, let's jump in and see and, and, and uh, understand for ourselves, experience for ourselves that we truly are better together. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for our amazing church. I pray, Lord, for all those who call this place home and all those who are visiting. Lord, I pray that you'd speak to them now. I pray, Lord, that you would just remind them, uh, Lord, that, that, that you, you designed them to be in community. All of us. We're never designed to be alone. No one really wants to be alone. And so, God, I pray that you would cause people, open up doors, open up conversations. For those who are going, ah, I just don't know, I pray you give them a peace and give them a confidence to jump in, to try it out, Lord, and see what you would actually do when we jump in. For those of us who have been in groups, man, continue to, to grow us together, to, to keep going deeper, to keep being more transparent and vulnerable with one another, because that is when we can actually live more peace and freedom, and those relationships just continue to deepen. And all of this, Father, all of this really is so that we have a closer relationship with you where we don't have to do it alone. And so, God, we praise you. We thank you. We desperately need you. It's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thanks so much for joining me this morning. I'm excited. Can't wait to get back and see and be with you in person. God bless you.